in this ninth lecture, we want to look at one of the consequences of the Columbian Exchange, and that, of course, is Atlantic slavery. Um, to recap, we have Europeans in the New World seeking their fortunes uh, by producing commodity crops. Uh, the first of these would be sugar. Uh, later, we'll see tobacco and indigo and rice and cotton. Uh, in order to grow commodity crops, um, you have to have a vast labor uh, pool, and uh, Africans end up filling this need in the New World. So, I want to uh, uh, do a, an introductory lecture here on African and Atlantic slavery. Uh, we'll pick it up again later and talk about the antebellum South and slavery in the Old South before the Civil War. Uh, for this lecture, uh, let's distinguish between two types of societies. Uh, historians have come up with these categories. The first is a slave society, and the second is a society with slaves. Uh, this sounds a little confusing at first, but it actually makes sense. A slave society, um, here we use the word slave as an adjective to describe the society. Uh, so a slave society is a uh, is one in which slavery is essential. If you took slavery out of a slave society, you would have no laboring force. Your, um, your society would collapse. A uh, good example of a slave society? Well, here, where we live today, in northwest uh, Georgia. Uh, this was part of a slave society uh, for more than a, a century, uh, whereby the laboring force were African Americans. Uh, on the big plantations, uh, in, in this example, uh, producing cotton. Uh, slave societies uh, existed in Africa. There's a difference, though. Uh, uh, the slave society here in the United States before the Civil War uh, was a particularly brutal uh, example, as with the other slave societies in South America and the, and the West Indies, whereby slavery was perpetual. Uh, it did not end, uh, not with your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Uh, there was also no uh, upward mobility of any kind in the, in the slave societies of the Western Hemisphere. You tended, you tended to um, stay in that uh, class, that degraded class, forever. Uh, rarely would you escape from it. Now, societies with slaves are quite different. Here, slavery is simply one portion of the laboring class. Uh, in a society with slaves, you could uh, delete or withdraw slavery entirely, and the society would continue without missing a beat. Uh, you see these uh, societies with slaves in the North uh, before the Civil War. Uh, societies with slaves you could also find in Africa. Uh, here. In Africa, in West Africa especially, you find slaves uh, rising up out of that degraded uh, condition. Uh, slaves were often produced as, uh, uh, as prisoners of war or as somebody who owed a debt that they could not pay. Uh, they could be enslaved for this, but they could rise up out of it, uh, become a member of that family, uh, change their status. So societies with slaves, uh, much more lenient, I suppose, uh, much more mobile, a more dynamic uh, situation than a slave society. Now, I want to ask a basic question. Uh, why Africans? Uh, what is it about Africans that uh, lured the Europeans uh, to travel these great distances? Let's face it, the, uh, if you want to use the example of the English, the English looked at the Irish uh, as, as dogs and did not regard, have any higher regard for the Irish than they did the Africans. So why Africans for labor in the New World? Uh, there are a number of reasons, uh, and I want to go through them for you. First, uh, African slavery already exists. Nothing has to be created. No institutions have to be founded by the Europeans. Um, slavery has existed in Africa for centuries. And the Europeans are simply taking part in this already existing institution. Um, second, the Africans appear to be uh, available in unlimited numbers. Uh, third, Africans are color-coded. They're black. Uh, 
uh, in the mind of the European, white equals freedom and black equals slavery. So if you are in, um, in Barbados in the 17th century and you see an African American or a black person, you know that by definition they are slaves. Let's face it, uh, if we used Irish as slaves, uh, an Irishman could conceivably dress up and look like us, couldn't he? Uh, he could pass himself off as a free person. An African cannot. He cannot disguise the color of his skin. Uh, another reason for Africans. There is the belief that Africans live in a subtropical climate in Africa. Therefore, they will be able to thrive in a subtropical climate in the Western Hemisphere. Um, again, just to use the Irish uh, as a counter example, uh, it's believed that uh, pasty, freckled Irishmen would wilt in the brutal heat and uh, environmental conditions in the West Indies and South America, whereby the Africans, on the other hand, will thrive, having already lived in those similar climatic conditions. They will thrive uh, in the heat and the humidity. Uh, another reason for Africans, they have the necessary skills. They are an agricultural people. Uh, they know how to, uh, to farm. They have the basic understanding and skills for what we need uh, for them to do in the new world. In fact, they will teach uh, their white masters uh, many lessons in agriculture. Uh, another reason for Africans, uh, especially in West Africa, is there is a genetic mutation uh, the sickle cell. Uh, this sickle cell, although debilitating in, in other ways, uh, does uh, fight off malaria. So if you are a white slave owner and you're looking to augment your laboring force, uh, Africans uh, north from the northwest portion of Africa are especially attractive because of the sickle cell. That initial investment in a slave can be uh, expensive. So you would like very much for that slave to uh, thrive and live a long life and uh, perhaps reproduce so that your children's children will also have a laboring force at hand. So these are some of the reasons that made Africans attractive as slaves. I want to say something else about the African slave trade here. Uh, we talked about agency earlier when we talked about key terms and concepts. Uh, the African slave trade demonstrates um, African agency very well. Uh, we tend to think of the story of slavery as simply one of white oppression. And of course it's more complex than that. Uh, Europeans would venture to the west coast of Africa and wait aboard their ships for the African chieftains uh, to decide when the transaction should take place. In other words, the slave trade is entirely in the hands of the African chieftains who send uh, raiders into the interior uh, to capture other Africans, to bring them to the coast, to house them in these slave fortresses. And a European captain could wait three, six months, maybe a year uh, aboard ship waiting for the African chieftains to decide now is the time to make the transaction. So this complicates uh, our understanding of slavery uh, by attributing to the Africans themselves a great deal more agency than we had previously considered. Now there's another aspect of uh, Atlantic slavery that I want to touch on and that's the Middle Passage. It's called the Middle Passage because it's the, uh, the sea route between West Africa and the New World. This middle passage uh, demonstrates a few things uh, about Atlantic slavery that I think are worth mentioning. First, the slaves themselves rapidly uh, are reduced from human beings to simple laboring commodities. They're stacked aboard these ships uh, and these slave ships have multiple decks and so you see slaves stacked like cordwood, uh, sometimes head to toe, head to toe, uh, on the multiple decks of these ships. 
Now, these Africans, although they are a, a river-going people, uh, they were mostly uh, not an ocean-going people. And for those of you who have been uh, on a cruise or deep sea fishing in the ocean, and you've experienced uh, seasickness, you know that it's a, it's a miserable experience. Uh, can you imagine hundreds of Africans uh, stripped and chained uh, to the deck of these ships, uh, the decks of these ships, uh, experiencing seasickness for the first time on top of the sheer terror of being kidnapped and chained to the deck of a ship. Uh, we're talking uh, projectile vomiting here. We're talking uh, uh, human misery and uh, to an extent that it's difficult for our imaginations to comprehend. These Africans of course, won't, would like nothing more, presumably, than to take over the ship uh, and return to their homeland. So we have to intimidate them and control them. This is done through arbitrary violence. It's done through the shackling of the, of the slaves. It's done by mixing slaves of a variety of different languages together so they can't communicate and conspire. Uh, we can control them uh, by rationing their food feeding every other slave or every third slave uh, so that they constantly fight among themselves for food instead of conspiring to take over uh, the slave ship, kill the crew and the captain. So the, uh, the concern of the crew, of course, is to get these Africans to the New World where they can be sold. Uh, this is not Norwegian cruise lines. We are doing this for profit. Now. The, uh, the Africans, once they arrive in the New World, uh, quite often are simply auctioned. Uh, for those of you who have been to an auction, you know that it's, uh, uh, it can be an exciting adventure, uh, especially if you're in the market to buy something and you're competing or bidding against someone. Here, we're buying uh, human beings, or at least a shell of a human being, a laboring commodity. Uh, there's a very famous photograph, and we'll, we'll show it to you here in the film, uh, of a middle-aged African slave whose uh, back just uh, ripples with scar tissue from his shoulders all the way down, uh, thick layers of rippling scar tissue. Uh, can you imagine this man on an auction block, and you're in the audience as a, uh, someone bidding on prospective slaves? Uh, if you saw this man's back, you would understand immediately uh, that you don't want to bid on him. He's obviously trouble. He's obviously been whipped uh, a multitude of times for disobedience or uh, refusal to work or maybe running away. Um, even if you were a blind slave owner bidding for slaves, uh, you could tell that this would not be a man that you wanted to bid on. You could run your fingers down his back and you could read that scar tissue like Braille and understand that this is a troublemaker and you do not want him on your plantation. So I want to conclude this introductory lecture on slavery by noting that the vast bulk of the slaves will be sent to uh, the West Indies and to South America. Uh, the conditions here are harsh, or more harsh, than they are in North America, where a much smaller percentage of slaves are shipped to Charleston and Savannah, places like that. In Central and South America, we have much more brutal environmental conditions. The heat, uh, the type of work you do with sugar is dangerous. And um, you have a constant need to bring in more slaves to take the place of those slaves who have died under these brutal conditions. So we'll pick up slavery again when we talk about uh, the antebellum South and uh, slavery before the Civil War. Thank you.